All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, welcome to week eight. We're going to be talking about some more advanced image processing today. All of it focused towards face detection, because it's a pretty fun topic, and it's something that we tend to do on mobile phones an awful lot. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to realize that there are many solutions to this problem. Today we're going to talk about two of them. The first one is called eigenfaces. The second one is called the Viola Jones face detector. Both of them are not really restricted to face detection, but that's what they're most used for. They're really both more of a statistical signal processing or uh, object detection frameworks. Um, we're only going to implement the latter. The former is just mostly a good general uh, uh, tool in your toolbox to be used, and it's not really something that we're going to do in real time on a phone that often. You could do it offline just fine which many people do. Um, and there are some things that you can do with eigenfaces that are pretty cool, like face morphing, that we'll see later on. But Viola Jones is really where the real-time face detection is at. So that's what we're going to look at today. So the first thing to learn about eigenfaces is that it relies on the concept of principal component analysis. Who has ever heard of principal component analysis, PCA? OK, awesome. Who here has taken a linear algebra class? Great. How many of you guys remember what eigenvectors and eigenvalues are? Cool. So we're going to be using that a lot today to talk about principal component analysis. Um, PCA is often viewed in terms of trials. It's going to, we're going to give it multiple trials or multiple columns of data, however we want to look at it, and it is going to find common components or uh, patterns in that data that we give it. So if we give it, say, 500 faces, Hopefully, it will learn the overall shape of what a face is and what a face means. Um, this kind of concept is often used in machine learning because without any kind of uh, uh, constraints or um, preconceptions about what kind of data we're looking at, we can pull out common patterns amongst, uh, from all those different trials or all those different instances of data. That's what's called a... Uh, that would be part of like an unsupervised learning kind of paradigm, where we're not saying, hey, this is class A, this is class B. We're just saying, here's a bunch of data. Tell me what's similar across all the different trials. So let's talk a little bit about the theory behind how PCA works. PCA does singular value decomposition on a matrix that we're going to call X. This matrix singular value decomposition is basically the same thing as doing an eigenvalue decomposition on the matrix X transpose X. So we kind of take the matrix X, we kind of square it, and we get, and we do an eigenvalue decomposition on that. So this decomposition takes X and turns it into these three matrices that get multiplied together in order to reconstruct X. We've got a U matrix, we've got a sigma matrix, and we've got this V matrix that's always uh, Hermitian transpose there. So this sigma that I call S here, because usually we don't like to type Unicode letters into our code, so when we have a Greek symbol, we just turn it into the English equivalent. In this case, we represent that as an S. So this sigma is a diagonal matrix of singular values, and these control the weighting of the singular vectors. So diagonal matrix means everything off the main diagonal is zero. And what we, uh, the intuition behind what this kind of decomposition means is the U matrix is a series of columns, and the S matrix weights those columns in order to construct X. So this is very similar to the idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, where we have the eigenvalues, which weight the eigenvectors in order to reconstruct the matrix X. Uh, SVD, singular value decomposition, has U and V, which both serve kind of similar purposes. Here, they're both matrices full of vectors. We're not going to worry too much about that. We're just kind of getting the general uh, flavor of what SVD does. So, uh, PCA takes our matrix X and transforms it onto a specific basis, the basis being the vectors that are in this U matrix or the V matrix. They, they're very related. In this case, we're mostly going to be just assuming that U holds all the vectors that are the basis that we're going to transform our matrix X onto. So what that means is 
Let's say that we have a whole bunch of trials in a two-dimensional space. So when I say a whole bunch of trials in a two-dimensional space, I mean each data point, each trial, is in two dimensions, and I'm just plotting them all right here. So if I were to construct my X matrix, it would be a 2 by 1,000 matrix, because here I have 1,000 different trials. Each trial is two-dimensional. And I want to look at commonalities in all this data. I can use PCA, and it will rescue out a red line like this and a red line like this. There are two principal components that it finds. The length of this vector is the entry in sigma, in S. That's the singular value. And the direction is a column in U. So in this case, U is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. S is going to be a 2 by 1,000 matrix. And V is going to be a uh, 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, I think. Something like that. So we will look at all this data, and we'll say, all right, there's two singular values, one of them very large, one of them very small, and they go off in different directions. And the directions correspond with what kind of best approximates my data. So let's go ahead and do a live demo, quote-unquote live demo, which is just going to be a web page that I've set up that has a bunch of results of computation using code that's very similar to MATLAB and uh, kind of walks us through how we use PCA and what it does. So I'm going to go ahead and make this full screen. Make it as easily readable as possible. All right. Is that big enough? Is that too small? Do I need to make it bigger? Let's make it bigger. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to generate two-dimensional data. The way I do that is I just make a complex number where I have this x complex. I use rand n, all that good stuff, and then I scatter plot it. All right, very exciting. So we have something that looks like this. And we're going to say, all right, we want to use PCA to figure out what are the kind of common modalities in this data. In this case, as a human, we could look at it and just say, oh, obviously it's an ellipse. But PCA doesn't really work like that. PCA says, what's the direction of maximum variance? That's the first question it asks. And so it will find this direction. And then it will say, what is the second direction of maximum variance? And it will find this direction. So let's go ahead and see exactly how we do that. We perform SVD, and in pretty much every numerical programming language, MATLAB, Julia, Python, all those kinds of guys, you're going to have an SVD function. It will just do SVD on your X matrix. And so we get this USV thing. And the way that you get principal components is you take your S and you multiply it by U. And that is called T. So here I'm normalizing S just because it makes it easier to plot. And I say, OK, T equals U times S. So if we look at the PCA wiki page, which has an awful lot of math, they have this t equals x times w. That's the names that they use instead of u, s, and v. They have x and w and stuff. Whatever. It's all the same thing, just different names for it. Getting this t matrix, we get a 2 by 2 matrix. And so we'll grab elements from that 2 by 2 matrix. And when we plot them, we get these nice little red lines that go this way and that way. Is there anybody that has kind of a conceptual problem with this or doesn't understand kind of the, the generalities? I understand the specifics are a little hand wavy right now. But yes? Uh, because if we were to look at kind of the spread, so saying direction of maximum variance is another way of saying kind of, um, if I were to take this data set and project it onto a one-dimensional vector, what vector direction do I need to project it onto in order to have the biggest spread of values, right? If I were to project it onto a vector that looks like this, then it would have a spread from here down to here, right? And that spread would have a certain length. If I project it onto this direction, it'll have a spread from here down to here, and that length will be greater. Therefore, that direction has more variance. It's like, um, it's like asking what direction is most of the energy in this distribution of data spread along? Does that make kind of intuitive sense? Yeah. All right. Oftentimes, we're not dealing with like two-dimensional data here. Oftentimes, we're dealing with like 
thousand dimensional data, which we'll be doing in a little bit. This is like the intuitive two dimensional way of looking at things. The idea is we want to be able to do things like rebuild this data set with the principal components that we pull out. So I'm sure you guys all remember in linear algebra class, we talk a lot about things like finding a basis for a certain vector space and that kind of stuff, where we do things like we have some kind of vector space and we say, okay, this vector here is my first basis vector, this vector is my other basis vector, and using linear combinations of those two basis vectors, I can you know, address, I can move to any point in this space. That's the kind of thing that PCA does, but it chooses a basis it chooses a set of basis vectors that lie along the patterns of your data. So I can use the x and y you know, basis vectors, you know, one that moves me one direction along this axis, one that uses me one direction along this axis to address my data. Or I can use a set of basis vectors that adapt to my data. So I can use this first basis vector here and this, the next basis vector here. And the reason why you want to do that doesn't make much sense when we look at a, uh, at a plot like this. But it will make a lot more sense once we start to deal with more complex data and realize if we can have a vector that you know, represents a uh, significant component in our data, we can actually understand our data a little bit better. So let's scroll down and look at a different example. So here I am plotting a single instance of what I'm calling n-dimensional data, where n is 1,000. So here, a single instance was two-dimensional, so this dot would be a single instance. Just plotting that alone would be really boring. But here, we're significantly kicking up the dimensionality of our data. I'm saying our data is going to be a thousand dimensionality. So I can't plot one, you know, multiple instances of 1,000 dimensional data. We as humans just can't visualize that. But we can look at just a single instance. So this axis down here is actually like dimension. And this right here is value for each of those, uh, for each, you know, component in that 1,000 dimensional vector. So when I construct my matrix X, that's going to be multiple trials of 1,000 dimensional vectors, I'm going to have a 1,000 by M matrix. Because I'll have M trials, each with 1,000 data points. So this is how people do things like, say, um, MEG analysis or EEG analysis. They will have things like, um, for instance, when you're doing EEG analysis, you have like maybe 300 sensors on the uh, person's scalp, and you're taking recordings from those. And they may take a recording for a couple seconds and call that an epoch. And they're going to say, we're going to analyze this epoch. And it's a couple thousand samples long. They will want to do things like reject the influence of the power lines buzzing, because the sensors are so sensitive, they will pick up you know, oscillations in the electromagnetic field that has nothing to do with the brain. It has to do with the power outlet that's a couple feet away. And in order to reject that, they will say, okay, we want to find the commonality amongst all these uh, different electrodes and, and remove that. So they will do SVD on a, say, 1,000, if their sample length is 1,000 samples, they'll have a 1,000 by 300 matrix, where the 300... Uh, rows are all the different electrodes. And SVD will look at it and it will say, aha, I see something that's really common throughout all these different electrodes and give them back that as a principal component. And then they can subtract that from all of their signals and reduce the effect that power lines have on the uh, data that they're picking up. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're going to do here. So this is a single instance of the n-dimensional data. If you scroll down, we are going to do that generate data thing for like a uh, thousand times again. So we have a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. Each column here is one of those sinusoidal things with a little bit of noise added. And so we can see here that we have something that looks really, really similar across the rows and is sinusoidal across the columns. Any questions about this kind of data set? So, if we do PCA on that data, so the same kind of thing, we call SVD, we get this USV thing, we say S divide equal norm S, T equals U times S. This diag M thing, by the way, it's because the S that it gives us, they know it's going to be diagonal, so they don't bother to give us, like, 
number 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, or number 0, 0, 0. They just give us the diagonal numbers. And so diag m takes a vector that represents a diagonal and turns it into a fully fledged matrix so we can do the actual matrix multiplication here. Just little details, whatever. So we say plot the first principal component. So this T matrix that we have is going to be a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. And we say, OK, give us the first principal component. So that's going to be the component that explains the maximum amount of variance in our data. And what it gives back is a nice little sinusoid. <laughs> it's got a little bit of wiggle. You can see that if we, if we zoom in right here, uh, it's, got, you know, it's not a perfect sinusoid. But it looks pretty darn good. If we were to plot the second principal component, it's much smaller and looks like noise. And so what this is telling us is that most of the variation in this data set is due to a sinusoid that's happening across all the trials. And the next thing that's due to most of the variance is noise. And that makes complete sense because the way that we're generating this is we're generating a sinusoid and adding noise. And the sinusoid has a lot more strength to it than the noise does. Does that make sense? OK, let's take this a step further. We could say, I can do the exact same thing with like filtering, right? If I knew what kind, you know, if I took a look at my data and said, oh, there's a sinusoid here, I could just build a filter and, and take it out. Or I could do an FFT of the data and say, oh, look, there's a huge spike here. Of course, that huge spike is accounting for most of the variance in our data. But this isn't really doing sinusoidal decomposition. And to prove that, we're going to try doing something a little bit different. We're going to take, instead of assigning to this x sine thing, instead of giving it just a single sinusoid, we're going to give it two different sinusoids that are of different frequencies. All right? So our single column of data is going to look like this. And our x matrix will look like this. So it's no longer a simple sinusoid. And when we do SVD on this, we could think of a couple different things happening. One of them is the first singular component will be a low frequency sinusoid, and the second singular component will be that higher frequency sinusoid, right? Because one will account for a smaller amount of variance, and another will account for a, or sorry, one will count for a bigger amount of variance, and one will count for a smaller amount of variance. That's not really what happens, though. We just get all the sinusoids out as one big thing. And the reason being, because this shape is the uh, signal, the component, that is common across all trials. And the can second one, sorry? In your different data sets, if you varied the phase between the two sinusoids, would you get one sinusoid and the other? That's a good question. We're not going to vary the phase, though. We're going to vary the amplitude. So here's where we create an X matrix where for each column, we assign a random amplitude to three different sinusoids. So here we're going for X equals one to N. We get random amplitudes, one that's one times a random number, one that's 0.3 times a random number, and one that's 0.1 times a random number. Right? Then we create three sinusoids with three different frequencies. And then we add in some noise, and we call that a single trial. And we do that, you know, a thousand times. And we get a, vector, a matrix that looks like this. So we can see there's kind of some sinusoidal stuff going on, right? Because we're not messing around with the phase or the frequencies, we have areas where it's always zero. We have areas where it tends to be large, etc. So now it's getting significantly more difficult for us as a human to look at this data set and say, oh yeah, there are three, sin you know, there are three sinusoids going on here and uh, they all have random amplitudes. Like that's a, kind of a bit of a stretch for us as a human to look at this and say. However, when we do SVD, we get the first principal component out as a sinusoid like this and the second principal component out as a sinusoid like this. And if I had, oh, there we go. Third principal component is a sinusoid like this. And you'll notice the y-axis here match, to a certain degree, the amplitudes that I was assigning, right? The random amplitudes that I was giving, one is going to be one times a random number, the other one's going to be much smaller, 0.3 times a random number. You know, on average, it'll be a lot smaller. 
So the first principal component here is much larger than the second component here, which is indeed itself larger than the third principal component. And the fourth principal component is noise. Any questions so far? All right. So, moving just a little bit more forward, we say, how can I differentiate between principal components that seem to have some kind of meaning, like this, and principal components that are just noise, like this? And the answer is, the information that we're given is not just these components. That's, these components are pretty much stored in that U matrix, right? Because we have this X equals U times sigma times V thing. The information about how significant each principal component is, is stored in S. And so if we take a look at, say, the first 40 components of S, we see something that looks like this. And this says, the first principal component accounts for this much variance in your signal. The second principal component accounts for this much variance in your signal, and so on and so forth. And so we can see that the first three are very significant, and the rest are all pretty much zero. So this is really cool, because what this has just given us is a tool that we can run on a piece of data, and it will basically tell us, I can take your 1,000 dimensional data and accurately represent it with just three basis vectors. Right? Because each of these, uh, each of these sinusoids is basically acting like a basis vector in a 1,000 dimensional space. So I can take these basis vectors and I can say, all right, in order to reconstruct this column right here, I will take like 0.3 times this principal component, 0.7 times this principal component, and 1.2 times this principal component. And that will account for most of the energy in that column. And that's exactly what SVD does. It takes your matrix, it has all these different uh, columns, and says, all right, what's the best way, you know, what's the first vector that corresponds to the maximum variance, meaning what's the first vector that uh, is able to represent the most amount of the energy across all the different trials. And the other great thing about SVD is that it always returns the most important vector first, the second most important vector second, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always sorted so that this, uh, this graph is monotonically decreasing. Any questions about this? So is this type of thing get used for compression? Oh yes, absolutely. So this is the kind of thing where, um, for instance, especially things like audio compression, so like MP3 does things that are similar to this. It will transform into the frequency domain, do uh, singular value decomposition, well maybe not singular value decomposition, but something similar to it, to the audio and it will look at and say, oh, I only need three basis vectors. So I can store just three vectors, and then I can recreate stuff that otherwise would have taken a thousand vectors. Um, yeah, definitely. JPEG. JPEG uses things like this for image compression. It will do things like the DCT, which is the discrete cosine transform, which is a lot like the Fourier transform, but a little different. And it will do things like, it'll take the discrete cosine transform, look at everything that uh, is low enough, and just set them to zero. And that'll compress better. Things like that. All right. Uh, that's the end of this little webpage thing. You can go here and look at the plots and code yourself. Uh, it's written in something called Julia, but it's almost exactly the same as MATLAB for all intents and purposes. So you can uh, take this and play around with it in MATLAB if you want. So, given that we are now completely confident in our knowledge of how PCA works, we can start to talk about eigenfaces. Eigenfaces uses principal component analysis to learn the overall structure of a face. So what I mean by that is, we will feed it a whole bunch of different images of faces, and the principal component that it extracts from all those images will be kind of the overall illumination pattern of a face. 
So it might have, say, like the forehead and the cheekbones and dark spots for the eyes, that kind of thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an image of a face and represent it as an n-dimensional vector. So we'll take a, an image of a face, crop it so that it's only around a person's face, maybe convert it to grayscale for simplicity. And then we will take that, say, 25 by 25 pixel image and represent it instead as a whatever 25 times 25 is long vector. Kind of like how it's actually laid out in memory. And so we'll construct our X matrix that we're going to do PCA on with multiple images of faces. So each column, instead of being like a sinusoid and noise, it will instead be all these different images of faces. And so the components of the images that are most consistent are, of course, the principal components that we're going to get pulled out. And so you can imagine, if we have a bunch of pictures of someone's face, you know, cropped in close, uh, we're going to get consistent principal components that will look like ghostly faces. And so if we have a collection of data that looks something like this, uh, we will get something that looks kind of like this. So we will have, say, this thing that we call average face, which a lot of these algorithms will do mean subtraction first to make the PCA work better and ignore the mean value. So let's just take all, those, all these pictures, add them all together, get the average vector, you know, this average face thing, and subtract that. And then they start looking at eigenfaces. So here, uh, we have something that they, the authors who uh, wrote the paper that I stole this image from said they think that because the lighting condition was the same across all the faces, so you can see everyone is pretty brightly illuminated by like a, I don't know, it almost looks like a ring uh, light that's really close to their face. So there's minimal shadows, all that kind of stuff. That's what this eigen face represents, is that kind of illumination. And then this one is the illumination pattern of the, uh, right underneath the eyebrows and all that kind of stuff. Um, right here, we've got kind of an illumination pattern for light coming from below, all that kind of stuff. Regardless, all of these eigenface things are just columns in that U matrix. And we are going to be able to take these columns, all these different eigenfaces, weight them appropriately, add them all together, and reconstruct an image of a face. So we should be able to take this guy's face and reconstruct it out of a linear combination of all these eigenfaces. Everybody got that? All right. So, in order to do face detection, we go backwards. We take a random chunk of the image, say a random 25 by 25 pixel chunk of the image, and we decompose it. The way we decompose it is not by doing SVD across a whole bunch of different things. We already have our basis functions. These are our basis, sorry, our basis vectors. So just like you would be able to do projection of a, you know, of a data set onto a single vector and get you know, the length along that vector, we're doing the exact same thing here, except that our vectors are 25 squared long. They're not you know, too long. So we take a random chunk of our image. We represent it as a, I'm going to say that 25 times, 25 by 25, I don't know why I chose that. We'll say 5 by 5, right? Very low resolution faces. We have a 25 length vector, which is our test image. This is a chunk of our overall image that we want to say, is there or is there not a face within this portion of the image? So we take that 25 dimensional vector and we project it onto this eigenface. And that length is a coefficient. And so we store that coefficient. We then do the same for this guy, for this guy, for this guy, for this guy. And this is why we call this eigenfaces. It's because we're treating this like I have a data point and I'm projecting it onto all my eigenvectors and getting eigenvalues out of it. Doing this kind of uh, computation, we can then say, all right, I got a set of eigenvalues for this testing image. I then compare it to the set of eigenvalues that I got for, for putting my training faces through. So 
if I put my face through, I'll get a certain uh, coefficients, certain eigenvalues. If I put someone else's face through, I'll get a different set of eigenvalues. But they'll be fairly similar to each other compared to if I take a picture of a house and put it through this algorithm, I'm going to get completely different eigenvalue coefficients. So the name of the game is, can I figure out if my eigenvalues are close enough to my training eigenvalues? And that is a very simple machine learning problem that we have uh, already talked about methods for doing. You could even just like take the, you have eigenvalues here, eigenvalues here, just take the sum of the squares of the differences and call it good and see if it's below a certain threshold. That's literally what we do in machine learning, or in uh, computer vision classes. And it works pretty well given that you are testing images that are very similar to the training data that you've given your algorithm. Because these eigenfaces, these uh, basis vectors, are going to be completely dependent on the training data that you sent, it, sent in at the beginning. So, for instance, a face viewed from the profile will look nothing like any of these eigenfaces, so you'll always get very low eigenvalues when you do your projection. Even if you have differently illuminated faces, it could look totally different. And there are data sets on the internet where they have hundreds of pictures of faces taken from all different kinds of uh, illumination styles and orientations, you know, 45 degrees, 35 degrees, all that kind of stuff, expressly for the purpose of doing eigenfaces. Any questions? Right, so you have to do this kind of detection on every sub-image in the, in the image. So let's say your image is, is like, you know, 1024 by 768, right? But your eigenfaces are 25 by 25. Then you take a 25 by 25 window here and test to see if it's a face or not. Then you take a 25 by 25 image here and test to see if it's a face or not, etc., etc. So you keep on doing that until... Um, Right. And it's important uh, for the um, learning images, we just crop it by our hand, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, with these kinds of approaches where you're testing sub images to see if that sub image is a face or not a face, you kind of have to decide yourself, you know, how much time can I spend doing this kind of thing? So, you may not test, like, you know, starting at 0, 0 and going to 25, 25. Then starting at 0, 1 and going to 25, 26, you may not skip by one, Im by one pixel. You may test this area, then skip by 10 pixels, test this area, then skip by 10 pixels, test this area. Simultaneously, this is not very, uh, well, to make a pun, scalable. Uh, the, a large face when the camera is close up is going to look very different than a face when the camera is far away. So you not only have to test across different positions, you also have to test across different scales. You may take like a 50 by 50 pixel uh, area of the image, down sample by two, use that as a 25 by 25 image, and test that as well. So clearly, very quickly, this is going to get computationally expensive, right? In our, uh, in our homeworks, we found out that if we want to get 30 frames per second, we can't even look at every pixel in the image, much less do projections and stuff for every pixel in the image. So, eigenfaces won't run in real time on a phone, at least not without doing some serious parallelization, which will take weeks in this class. So, we're not going to do that in real time. We might do that offline, though. And so, yeah, this is the kind of thing that you would get. This is a, a picture from when I took the class, when I took the computer vision class a couple years ago here. Uh, we just took pictures of ourselves. Oops. We just took pictures of ourselves in front of a whiteboard, and this is the kind of thing that you would get. You would get regions where it says, aha, this is indeed a face. There's one other thing that you can do with eigenfaces, which is pretty darn cool, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that. Uh, when we take a face and project it onto our eigenbases, we project it onto all these eigenfaces, we get coefficients that say, this face is made up out of 80% this face, 
12% this face and 8% this face, or something like that, right? Uh, so that may be my face, but for like John's face, it may say, okay, you know, he's got a nice manly beard, it's going to be more of this one and less of this one, or something like that. You can take your images, decompose them, use those uh, coefficients to recreate a face. And so you could recreate a face that's like halfway between my face and his face. That's called face morphing. And it's something that you can do with eigenfaces. So there should be picture or videos on like the internet. I don't think this one was very good because it mostly just looks like they're fading from one to the other. Uh, so they, they get images and then they drag a slider to show the morphing as they morph from one face to the other. So, well, maybe this one is okay. So they take one person's face and they morph it into another person's face. So you can see there's kind of a gradual transition here. And that's happening because it's taking the coefficients for one person's face and changing them into the coefficients for another person's face slowly. And the whole reason that this looks at all different from just taking one person's face, taking another person's face, and fading between the two, like just doing simple pixel blending, is because the pixels are changing according to those basis vectors that we learned from what does a face look like. So it won't give you stuff that doesn't look like a face unless you radically change the eigenvalues. And we're not radically changing the eigenvalues, we're just moving them between two valid faces. Because the, the space of all possible 25 by 25 images is really, really large. But when we do eigenfaces, we look at only a subset of that whole space because we're only looking along the basis vectors that we found by using PCA. Any questions about eigenfaces? Didn't they do that on the Tonight Show? Like, on a couple different late night shows, they would like blend faces. Is that how they did it? Um, no. So, okay, so there's a... Uh, there's a really good one, which is the Obama and uh, Bush face morph, right? <laughs> this one is just awesome. I love this one. So here we go. This is not done with eigenfaces. Eigenfaces won't be able to do this. Like this just looks like incredibly smooth, right? This is done with a specialized face morphing algorithm. So there, I forget the name of it. They don't see, uh, they don't name name it here, but. There is a face morphing algorithm. I'm sure if we Google it, uh, there's they'll give us the name. Yeah, the Bayer-Neely algorithm. That's probably how they did it. And so that's an algorithm that's specifically designed to do this kind of thing. And it does something a little more complicated than just you know eigenvalues. It will actually have face-specific stuff in that algorithm. Things to like know where the eyes are, know the outline of the head, that kind of thing. But I don't actually know that algorithm, so I can't explain it easily. Any other questions? Yeah, I know. Image processing is really fun, guys. So, uh, let's take a look at the time. Let's go ahead and talk about Viola Jones. So Viola Jones is an object detection framework. So it's not just used for faces, but it's commonly used for them. Oh, there's one other thing that I want to talk about with uh, ID faces first. You can actually do not only face detection, but face identification with it, right? Because you can take a picture of a face, take a picture of another face, look at the eigenvalues, and you can say, this person's eigenvalues look a lot like Elliot's set of eigenvalues. So it's him versus somebody else. That's just another machine learning problem where you have all these, eigenface, uh, all these eigenvalues, you treat that as your feature vector, and you can do classification on those feature vectors. All right. The Viola Jones is used for pretty much only detection, not usually uh, classification. And what it's going to do is it's going to use a cascade of what we call weak classifiers. So a weak cl classifier is a machine learning like classifier, a machine learning model that doesn't do very well. It might like it might be able to classify a little bit better than random chance, something like that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take all those classifiers and combine them together into a single decision. So I may have 200 different classifiers. And 180 of them say, yes, this is a face, 
and 20 of them say, no, this is not a face, and I'll say, no, this isn't a face, because all of them have to agree in order for this to actually be treated as a face. So those 180 ones may be an error, or the 20 of them may be an error, or something like that. Uh, the classifiers are going to use a feature that's called a har-like feature. It's named after the har wavelet, and uh, you're going to see it's really simple. So the har wavelet looks like this. It's a signal that's 1 for a period of time, and then negative 1 for a period of time, and 0 everywhere else. Almost the simplest signal you can possibly think of. Maybe if you didn't go to negative 1 instead of went to 0, it would be the simplest. So that's exactly what we do. We take features that look like this. These are two-dimensional har-like features. They're basically black and white rectangles. So we might say, okay, we've got four of them, right? We've got this one that's black here and white here. We've got this one that's black here and white here. We've got this one that goes white, black, white. I've got this one that's a little checkerboard. And what we're going to do with these features is we're going to correlate them with our signal. So this is an example of the same image just showing different, uh, different locations of these different features being put on top of the image. And what we do is when I say correlate, I mean the same kind of correlation that we do in 1D, right? We do like a sliding dot product kind of thing. In this case, we'll just think of it like a normal dot product. So we might take this image here on top of the face, do a dot product there, and we'll get a fairly high value, right? Because the eyes are dark here and the nose is a little bright here. Same here, dark eye, bright cheek. Bright stuff here, dark stuff here, that kind of thing. And so what these features do is they, um, they take our image and they give us coefficients for each of these features. So we'll get a coefficient for this one, which is the result of the dot product, coefficient for this one, which is the result of the dot product, etc. Yes? Exactly. We're just taking the pixel. So in this case, it's all grayscale, right? So we're taking the, the pixel and just multiplying it by the pixels in our feature. So zeros for black, ones for white. How do they get a large value for black pixels? So when I say large value, I mean relatively large value. So by that, I mean if I have something that's black and white here, right? And I combine the black with black stuff in the image. I combine the white with white stuff in the image, the black from the feature will be negating a small amount of energy because the, pic because the picture is already black. And the white stuff in the feature will be keeping things that are already white and are already large in the image. If I were to reverse it and I were to take the feature, which has black on top of white parts of the image and white on top of black parts of the image, I'll get an extremely small number, right? So that's how correlation works. When you match the big stuff with big stuff in the signal and the small stuff with small stuff in the signal, you get proportionally a much larger number than you would for any other combination. Because for any other combination, you're always going to have the black part of your feature uh, negating the energy, you know, dropping the energy of your signal down to zero. So, you, so in order to get a large number, that black part needs to be paired with another black part, and the white part needs to be paired with the white part. That's kind of the theory behind, um, behind correlation. So here, it's kind of doing its best, this image is doing its best to align the feature with the image in ways that kind of make sense. But really what we do is we search over every possible position, every possible scale, every possible like permutation of these features. And we get coefficients for each one. Those coefficients are used in classifiers. So each classifier is going to use one single feature. So for instance, this feature right here will have a classifier with it. And the classifier will have some kind of machine learning algorithm inside of itself. Because it's just one single feature, there's only so much you can do. It's basically a threshold, right? If the value is over a certain amount, then it's a face. If it's under a certain amount, then it's not a face. And so if this first classifier says it's not a face, then we just immediately say this whole image is not a face. If classifier 1 says it is a face, then we go to classifier 2, which then has a chance to say is a face or is not a face. 
and so on and so forth, all the way to classifier n, where if that one finally says yes to face, then we're golden. This is what's called a classifier cascade. It's a cascade because you have to make your way through all the classifiers before you can get to yes. And any single one of them can say no. And the idea is that these classifiers may not be very accurate, but we sacrifice the ability to uh, we sacrifice the ability to find faces a little bit in order to reduce the possibility of classifying things that aren't a face as a face. And so, all the intelligence is in the ordering of these classifiers, right? Um, our model that we're learning, machine learning, using machine learning speak, this, our model is this ordering of classifiers, where I have n classifiers and I put them in this order, and uh, these are the, the classifiers that I've chosen to be my, yes, this is a face, no, this isn't a face committee. And so the most reliable features are used first and the lesser ones last, and we use machine learning to create our model. What we're going to use is something called Adaboost. Adaboost is a neat little technique that allows us to take many, 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 many features and choose only the ones that will work the best and give us a cascade out of them. So let's talk about how we learn the cascade. Question? Yes. I don't know why the order of the classifier is so important. Because I think the order is only a factor of the computing speed. Yes, exactly. It's all that matters is computing speed, not accuracy. Oh, okay. Because if any single one of them says no, then we say it's not a face, and all of them have to say yes in order for us to say it is a face. So you're right. Maybe this slide is a little deceptively worded. The the when I say the ordering, I'm not just talking about the order. I mean like also the um, the selection of I should say selection instead of ordering here. The intelligence is in the selection of classifiers because even if we have just a 24 by 24 pixel window, there are like 162,000 features. And many implementations have a few extra uh, patterns, like not just checkerboard, but also like rotated checkerboard and stuff like that. So the number of possible features are, is enormous. And of course, we can't like check 162,000 classifiers for every subpixel in our image. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that real time on a supercomputer. So what Adaboost does is it picks the ones that are the most useful. So when we say useful, we mean they have, they have the highest accuracy. Even if the accuracy is kind of terrible, right? Even if the absolute best we can do is like 70% accuracy or something like that, it'll choose those ones first. And it will then iteratively choose features that complement the weaknesses of, that, of the already chosen features. So what that means is, using an image that I shamelessly stole from the internet, but uh, is fantastic, so I could not steal it. We may have a feature space like this, where I have my blue class and my red class, right? As I said uh, a couple weeks ago, machine learning often devolves down into, I have this arbitrary space and points in that space, and I want to separate them with a line. So that's exactly what Adaboost is doing here. I've got my feature space, I've got my data points, and I'm training up a model. The first thing I do is I choose a classifier that kind of sort of separates them, right? So this line gets three red on this side, one red on this side, three blue on this side, two blue on this side. And then, that's our first classifier. We then go ahead and run our classification again to find a new classifier, but we weight the ones that we incorrectly classified heavier. So when I say weight them heavier, I mean when we're calculating the error function of like how well does this classifier do, we're going to make these guys more important. And so what that does is it ensures that our next classifier, when combined with our previous classifier, will do better. Right? We're going to ensure that these guys are classified as blue by this classifier. And then we keep on doing that over and over again because this guy now is making new mistakes that the previous guy wasn't making. And so we create another classifier that is able to, uh, that is able to separate these. 
And then our overall classifier for these three classifications is going to be a combination of all three learned rules. And so what this does is it takes multiple rules that none of which are perfect and comes up with a weighted scheme where we're able to say, all right, this decision rule and this decision rule and this decision rule gets like, you know, 90% accuracy when each of them alone would get 60% accuracy. And the way that this works with our cascade is rather than, when, rather than having like a hard decision boundary here, we may decide to have a soft decision boundary where we say, okay, only stuff that's way over here is red, stuff that's way over here is blue, and stuff that's here will think about it. And then you move on to this one. That's one way of implementing this. Another way of implementing this is this whole thing is one step in that cascade. So rather than using just a single feature here, we could use like three features here and use that as our single classifier. Still very simple, but taking multiple features at once. There's different ways that you can do this. But this is the general idea. Luckily for us, we won't ever like write at a boost ourselves. Like you would have to be like trapped on a desert island and held at gunpoint to do this kind of thing by yourself. Because there's already libraries to do it. And even if we did want to, or even if we uh, do want to do our own training, we don't have to um, necessarily do our own training at all. Because there are already like pre-existing models that you can use and just download them and plug them into your uh, classifier. So for instance, the OpenCD project has pre-learned cascades for us. So if we take a look at it, they have these XML files where they say, all right, we've got a har cascade for the left eye. So that means they've trained up features that will, when doing classification on like a 24 by 24 pixel image, it will tell you, yes, this is, an, this is the left eye. No, this is not the left eye of a human being. Or they've got one for like an upper body. Or they've got one for like the face and profile. All these different kinds of models. Yeah, I don't know why this one exists, but uh, open source software is quirky sometimes. Um, there are also, of course, methods for doing this kind of training where you can just give it a bunch of data and it will do all the ADA boosts and stuff for you. But that's generally not uh, something that we want to do by ourselves. We just want to use the models that they've already created. Any questions about this cascade classification business? All right. So let's talk about using the cascades because this is something that we will actually do and something that we would have to actually write if we were to do something on Windows Phone. So I wrote something to do this because we didn't yet have OpenCV available for the phone uh, last I checked. Uh, well, I mean, last year. There is, it isn't there now. Um, but uh, the key idea is that even with just the features that Adaboos has picked out, it's still way too slow to try and do like a correlation with the image across all the possible sub-images and all that kind of stuff in real time. That's still way too slow we still have a hard time touching every pixel in our image. So there's a little cheat that we can use that has to do with the nature of our features. Basically, the fact that our uh, features are all just black and white rectangles. The thing that we can use is called the integral image. So if we start out with an image over here, this is called the original image, it's blue, and we calculate the integral image, that basically means we take a two-dimensional integral of this image and, and come out with this. So, for instance, this pixel here is going to be the summation of this pixel and this pixel. So that's 7, right? This one is 20, because that's 5 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 1 plus 4. This one is 30, because it's 20 plus this, which is 10, etc., etc. Using the integral image, we can then say, all right, what is the uh, dot product of the original image with a white block here and a black block here? And assuming that everything else is black, we basically only need to uh, worry about a white block. So we basically only need to worry about the white blocks with the har cascades. So if we've got a white block here, sorry, if we've got a white block here, then the 
the um, the dot product of this image with that white block is going to be 20 because it's the summation of everything in here, right? If we were to have a white block that was this big, it would be 26. If we were to have a white block that was this big, it would be 52 because it's the summation of everything to the up left of that bottom right corner. If we have a white, uh, if we have a white block that's not centered at the origin, but it's centered, say, here, then what we do is we have to take this area and subtract this area and this area, and then because we subtracted this part twice, we add it back in again. So basically, we take this number, subtract these two numbers, and then add this number again. Does everybody see how that works out? Thank you for answering for the whole class. I really appreciate that we have a spokesperson. All right, so the basic idea behind this is that we can take what used to be a problem that gets harder and harder and harder the larger the features get, and instead now runs in what we call constant time. No matter how many pixels I'm trying to sum together in my giant white rectangle, it's still just going to be four multiplications, or sorry, four additions now. Right? All the work is just done in creating this integral image at the beginning. I can then calculate as many features as I want, and it all will only cost four additions. And that's the beauty of using simple features like rectangles. So as long as we can get making the integral image fast enough, excuse me, which is not too hard because all it's doing is like a cumulative sum across the x and y directions, um, as long as we can get that running fast enough, we can do this kind of uh, operation very, very quickly. So, as said before, this allows a single feature to be calculated really, really quickly. Again, re regardless of the size of the feature. That's what makes it very scalable to high-resolution images. This is what allows this kind of detection to be done in true real-time on desktop computer. Like, your... Um, your MacBook Pro or whatever won't even be breaking a sweat doing this kind of thing on a 720p uh, video stream. On our phones, we can't quite do this on a full resolution video screen. We have to downsample a little bit, but we can still get it running at a decent approximation of real time. Um, so this kind of live demo doesn't work too well on the emulator, of course, because I don't have uh, the lib video doesn't work very well in the emulator. So there is a sample code application that can do this kind of thing, and this is the kind of thing that it should do. It will take your image, try and find faces in it, and when it can, it will overlay them with yellow. So this is the kind of thing that you will see. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code and see what it looks like. Because there's a few, uh, a few tricks being used by this application that are nice to know that are available for us on the Windows Phone. So of course this is going to be in the sample code of homework uh, or of week 8. It's called Viola Jones. It's going to use lib video, texture graph, all that kind of stuff, and it has a C++ component called face detection. So let's pin the solution explorer. Yes. Uh, I think I am recording this actually. Yes, I am. So, the face detection application has lib video, texture graph, a C sharp thing called Viola Jones, and face detection. The C sharp project is pretty simple. It's going to have a small piece of code in the constructor that says load in our detector, and it does that thing that we showed in class a few weeks ago, where it loads up a file that's been bundled with our application, and is then going to construct a C++ object off of it called detector. This XML file that's loading is right here, it's called modelsface.xml, and this was downloaded from the OpenCV uh, website, and it's a har cascade that says, all right, I 
work on 20 by 20 images. Here's my first feature. It's got rectangles with these coordinates. This one is black, this one is white. And this is the threshold value, left value, right, blah, blah, blah. All this gross stuff. We're not going to worry about that too much because we already have code written to, do, to use that and turn it into a classification, uh, a classification cascade. So that's how we load in our detector. And then we have a canvas loaded thing, which will just operate with the texture graph uh, as we're so used to. So we do our code where we take our texture graph in, do all that stuff, create a camera, create this thing called image processing, and then do the cam on frame ready, image processing dot frame processed, all that kind of stuff. Exactly like how we did it with the red rectangle localization in homework five. Let's take a look at that C++ component called face detection. There's this guy called image processing dot cpp. Inside of image processing, it's very simple. It just says, first off, the constructor takes in this thing called detector, and that detector object is that thing that we created in the C sharp code. So we created this detector thing, we say detect equals new detector, and we pass in that XML file. And this detector object, we store it here, it's called detector. And when we create our image processing, we pass in an object of type detector. So this is another example of how, in our C++ code, our image processing class doesn't like go out and find a detector object. It waits for C# -sharp to pass in the detector object after the C# -sharp code has created it, because we like to use C# -sharp as the glue that puts everything together. So inside of image processing, we say, all right, detector. We call it D because we're very um, eloquent. We say find faces. We pass in width, height, data pointer like we're used to, and a couple of parameters, which I'll explain in a minute. We get back this array of rectangles we, that we call faces. We say for every rectangle in faces. Oh, for those of you that have never seen this kind of syntax before, um, this for rect r colon faces thing is a new C++ feature that came out in like 2011 or 2012 or so. It's a C++ standard called C++ CX, or no, or sorry, CX, uh, C++ 11. And uh, it's called a, this is like a for each loop. It says, we know that faces is a collection of objects that are of type rectangle. So I can make a for loop that just says, okay, assign my local variable r to each value in faces sequentially. This is just a, like a shortcut to saying, you know, from one, to, from zero to the length of the, uh, of the uh, collection have index into it, you know, once, the second, the third, the fourth, that kind of thing. Very useful. So this find faces function is going to pass us back an array of rectangles. And for each rectangle, we're going to just say, okay, we'll go from the top to the bottom, the left to the right, and blend in a hex value that means yellow. Any questions about this kind of stuff? Or should we jump into the find faces function? Just as a general overview to see what it does. All right, so we'll go ahead and open up facedetection.cpp and scroll down to the bottom. So in facedetection.cpp, we have this function called findFaces. If we look at the facedetection.h file, we see a little bit of documentation. It says findFaces, it does all the work, it takes in a width, a height, a data pointer, takes in a downsample factor, because of course this is built on top of the frame class. So if we want to downsample by a certain amount just right off the bat, this is where we do it. It takes in something called scale step and shift step. Now what scale step and shift step deal with is when we're taking sub-images in, uh, in the image, how much do I shift it by? And when I want to go to the next scale down, how much do I scale it down by? So if we were to pass in, say, 0.25 into scale step, that means that it will shift over 25% every time it moves on to the next position. And if we put in like, uh, or I'm sorry, that's for shift step. For scale step, it means that every time we want to make it smaller, we go down by like a quarter of the size if we pass in 0.25. So these kinds of parameters will 
take up more work the smaller you make them, because if I make it shift by only 10%, right, we're going to be looking at more sub-images, but it will make your detection of where a face is in an image more accurate. Because you may, you may if you have your uh, shift step too large, get a picture here, get a picture here, get a picture here, like that. So you never really uh, perfectly center on the face. Uh, same thing with downsample factor. I mean, downsample factor basically means that you are only going to get faces that are larger than a certain size. Because as seen in the XML file, the OpenCV models are built to work on 20 by 20 pixel images. So if I have a face that's, say, when I take the picture, it's 100 by 100 pixels, and if I downsample by, say, a factor of 10, my face will become 10 by 10 pixels. And then my OpenCV classifier is not going to find it because it's not going to be looking for something that's half as small as what it trained on. If I downsample by a factor of 5, then it will find it when it goes to the smallest possible size. If I downsample by a factor of 2, then that means that I will have to have my scale step set up properly so that eventually I will get to close to that face being represented as a 20 by 20 pixel image. Does that make sense? All right. So let's take a real quick look at the C++ code and see what's going on. We create a frame F as usual. We have a array of rectangles, this STD vector thing that we've seen a couple times before. Uh, we do some stuff that's not terribly interesting. We check to make sure that the sizes are proper. Uh, we convert to this says val scale, but that's just the OpenCV way of saying uh, grayscale. We call calc integral. We square uh, the values, and then we call calculate integral again. So this is a way to calculate that integral image, as I said before. And calc integral is really simple, right, as we think it should be. We go along the first x length and sum up looking only at the previous value to the left. We'll go across the first y length, sum across the value only uh, directly above us, and then we go along and so we say, okay, for every value x and y, we are going to add in x and y plus x, y minus 1, and x minus 1, y, and x minus 1, y minus 1. So we're just calculating the cumulative sum as we go throughout the image, that kind of thing. Um, and after that, it's just some really gross code to go through and look at the areas of values, uh, areas of uh, locations in that stuff. This is uh, the kind of code that you kind of hope you never have to write. But if you ever had to write something like that, like it, you could look at this for inspiration on how to do it, hopefully. Um, I would love to run this on the phone and show you all how it looks. So I'm going to try and do that by just Googling faces. Faces of death. I'm not sure why that's being uh, shown as a... <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, when we run the app called Viola Jones, and we look at the screen, you can see that it's kind of flashing some of the faces of yellow, and that's because it's detecting them. Now you can see that it's not doing a terribly great job, right? Sometimes it detects it as a face, sometimes it doesn't detect it as a face. Yeah, I'll hold it over for you guys as well. So sometimes it detects the face. Sometimes I go completely black. There we go. So once it adjusts the image, you can see it's kind of flashing yellow, right? Uh, that's because sometimes the classifier works and sometimes it doesn't. Most of these kinds of algorithms are not actually run every single frame. They maybe run every other frame, in which case they can have, uh, you know, computation that takes more than just 1 30th of a second, that kind of thing. And they'll just keep the positions that they found last frame over to the even numbered frames and only do computation on the odd numbered frames or something like that. Um, the parameters that I have in the sample application right now allow it to run at close to 30 frames per second. But in doing so, it sacrifices some of the accuracy. 
So if you guys want to play around with it, feel free to go to that image processing.cpp and muck around with these parameters. This is saying down sample by five, you know, skip by that much, scale by that much. Um, if we change it from five to four, which means that it will be able to find smaller faces in the image, then we would then it will have a significant increase in computational load, right? We're going to be doing uh, quite a bit more processing, and it won't be able to run at 30 frames per second. It will run at like 20 frames per second or something like that. But that's the kind of thing that you would do if you were to do something like cheat and only do the uh, the detection operation every other frame or every other other frame or something like that. Any questions about doing this kind of processing? I realize that pouring over code is not the most interesting thing to do on a Monday night, but any questions about these kinds of apps in general, these kind of detection apps or video streaming apps, that kind of thing? Does your frame class work well with the OpenCV stuff? Not really. So OpenCV has its own kind of uh, image format. And in order to use any of the OpenCV functions, so for instance, there are OpenCV functions to do things like calculate the integral image, do uh, HAR classification, that kind of thing. In fact, if you just Google for like OpenCV uh, face model HAR, there's an entire page about doing face detection using HAR cascades. And I think I might have ripped some of their pictures off. Um, and they, the way that they do it is they actually will have an overall face model and a left eye model and a right eye model. And they'll find all those things so that you can get an idea of like the orientation of the face as well, which is pretty neat. But in order to do this, you need to have your image in the format for OpenCV to, you know, muck around with it. And so you could probably come up with some really efficient way to convert a frame to an OpenCV image, but you wouldn't be able to do things like the automatic downsampling and stuff like that. That wouldn't work with OpenCV. And as such, you would have almost no hope of running this kind of thing in real time using OpenCV's software, because they wouldn't downsample at all. They might have an op option to do it, actually, but I don't know. Any other questions? Yes? Are there any algorithms that are used for really high degree of precision? Like, can you track exactly how the eye is moving? Or yeah. Do you need to take certain features? Yeah. So uh, there are more general methods, like SIFT, which we talked about last time. You can train up SIFT features on faces and use those. There are face-specific algorithms as well. There's something called, I was just looking at it earlier today. Uh, I forget what it's called, but if you search for like face detection or face orientation API, there are plenty of, uh, of things. Actually, <laughs> I remember where I came across it. So I have a, I have a bonus slide, which is uh, CV Dazzle. So CV Dazzle, oh, come on. There we go. CV Dazzle is camouflage from face detection, makeup, and styles, which I thought was just awesome. So uh, this guy has come up with styles that make your face completely just uh, zonk out face detection algorithms <laughs> for, for privacy or something like that, or maybe just for fun. I don't know. But uh, so you have these like these contours and stuff that you put on, and those completely disrupt any kind of those rectangular patterns that we've learned up in our, in our models, right? So if you walk around like this, uh, you can be assured that, for instance, uh, Google Street View is not going to blur out your face in their Street View or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so the guy who wrote this used a... Uh, what is it? He has a he has a list of things that it uh, that it cancels out. I'm not sure where it is, but anyway, so he's he's got a list of like face detection algorithms that he defeats, and you can use that list of face detection algorithms to find the one that will work best for you. But there are definitely ways to do things like estimate like the direction of the face, as well as like where the eyes are looking. Um, there's a lot of things like on Android phones and such, you'll find that 
some phones have this feature where you, like you can be reading something and you can go like this and it'll like scroll up or this and it'll scroll down and stuff like that. And so it uses the forward facing camera to estimate your both where your eyes are looking and wh which direction your face is looking. And I forget the name of the algorithm they use for that. It's not just plain har, it's something more face specific. Because it actually does like, I believe what it does is it takes, it looks through your eyes and then it does match filtering, where match filtering is very similar to what we did with those har features. It's like the shift and dot product thing. Um, basically, it's filtering, but with an impulse response that looks like what you're trying to detect. And so it does that, and it looks for your eyeball, and then it looks for the curve of your iris, and uses that to try and guess what direction your eyes are pointed. Any other questions? Do you know the name of that app on the app? It's just part of the Galaxy, uh, the Galaxy uh, default software. I mean, Samsung has a name for it. It's like Sense or TouchWiz or something like that. I think Sense is HTC. I think it's TouchWiz. It's their proprietary uh, Android modifications. All right. With that, we are done for today. Short class, but hopefully short and sweet. So I will see you guys upstairs.